Welcome! In this video we're going to explain the concepts of ownership, borrowing and references and uh, hopefully bring you up to speed with what they actually mean in uh, a way that's really intuitive and also provides the motivations for why Rust does what it does. The, we'll start with a program you've seen probably several times and add just a tiny bit of complexity. We'll print out uh, a book and we'll call it uh, B. And what I want to do is we'll immediately uh, receive a compile error here. We need to be able to print it out to the screen. So I'll derive debug which will teach Rust how to convert my book to a string to print to the console. Oh, and then I also need to add the modifier in the formatting string. And now I get hello book. We're off. Uh, <laughs> now, if I wanted to be clever for some reason, let's say that I had some nested scope and I thought, I would like a second book and I think the way that I'll do that is by just duplicating the value and I'll or not even duplicating I'll just essentially I want to do something over here like uh, and notice I'm using the let I'm rebinding to a new name uh, inside some nested scope and uh, I want to print out b2 and B1. So conceptually we see this as program as we know that uh, B1 on line 12 is still in local scope and we don't delete anything we, or at least we don't delete B2 and so we sort of have this intuition that this is a program that's perfectly valid. If we try and run this Rust complains very loudly that it's not a valid Rust program. And that's essentially the crux of the problem. As you are learning Rust, you need to be able to figure out what Rust is thinking. And it might help by identifying why Rust is complaining uh, and as, as well as like what it is doing. So one of the things that it is guarding, so first of all, so to, we need to define like what an owner is in Rust. And the definition is uh, slightly ambiguous because we normally say that it is responsible, like the owner is responsible for uh, memory management, let's say. Or something along those lines. You might see some references to memory management or double freeze, for example, or uh, other bits and pieces like that. Now the problem with that is that ownership is actually more general purpose. It's, and if you focus too much on memory, you'll find that Rust, that you're, you'll come into a, a, strange, uh, a strange problem later on. Uh, uh, now for the moment while you're learning, I think that you could say at the end of the scope, there is an asterisk there. Uh, it turns out that uh, it's slightly more complicated. It's it's more technically precise is that the drop implementation, uh, so, oh gosh, now I've got myself tangled up. What I want to say is that it uh, invokes the drop implementation for T. when needed. That's what the borrowing system, sorry, the ownership system is doing. Now you think, well, what about why? Like what is the motivating factor? Uh, let's go and answer that. So at the, at line 16 here, uh, I have B2 uh, ends its scope. And on uh, line 20 now, B1 ends its scope. Because they both refer to exactly the same data, or at least notionally, there's the possibility that like the uh, that drop will be called twice. So Rust is guarding against double freeze, or at least uh, 
guard against cleanup. Because if this is a, a problem, uh, because, and it, so even though you might think, oh look, I'm never actually touching anything to do with the original data uh, that is held by B1, you still have this problem that Rust will attempt to delete it at the end of its scope. And so therefore attempting to access it later is invalid. And because it's guaranteed at compile time, there's, there's no sort of other way around this. Uh, that's essentially the trade-off that Rust has made, that it would rather be safer, even though there are problems with learning. And uh, and that's the sort of the problem that uh, that you face as someone who's kind of getting started. Let's move this to the top of the program. Uh, and I now want to introduce uh, two ways around this. So one of the problems I also, another problem that I have encounter uh, when I sort of teach Rust is that if I were, oh, one of the ways, that, let's ignore book for the moment. One of the reasons why this is a difficult thing to learn is that if I have B1, and this is actually 123 and B2, uh, it turns out that this program runs and it will run for, you know, a floating point number or if I wanted to call B2, let's say a string. Oh, and I'll say hello Tim. Uh, I think this works too. And notice because we're calling debug, we still get double quotes for the for the string slice. But now when I want to use my own custom types, the program blows up. And the reason why that is, is because most of the types that you're dealing with as your learner implement the copy trait. So we can see the reference to the copy trait over here. Now the copy trait is essentially some way of uh, sidestepping the borrowing system and it does that by duplication. So we have B1 and B2, these are each local variables. At the point on line 13 when we uh, create B2 we duplicate the value as, uh, on uh, at B1. And so now we get we get two books uh, in memory. But what we really wanted was one book. The Another way around this is to take some reference. So we quote borrow B1. Now you may wonder if you are from a uh, systems programming background, why on earth did you not need to dereference B2? To actually access the data. Uh, this uh, Rust is provides essentially some hidden control flow. Uh, it automatically dereferences a reference during method calls and uh, it's arguable that this is the right thing to do. It's certainly a syntactically convenient thing to do but it is uh, again a little bit complicated if you are from like a systems programming background. So we're touching a little bit around references and this and borrowing. So references, so let's go references and uh, slash borrowing. Now these two terms are used in uh, the uh, they, these two use uh, these two terms are used interchangeably. They're not quite interchangeable though. A reference understands the lifetime of what. So you could think of a reference as uh, as a pointer, then a. Uh, and it that also understands the lifetime of its uh, of what it's pointing to, as well as the data type. So our pointers understand their data types and a or the width of the point the address the width of number of bytes 
that the uh, pointer is pointing to. You could think of a reference as being something that also understands the lifetime. And a borrow in has a little bit more specific to Rust uh, in terms of understanding the semantics between a shared reference and an owned reference. Uh, oh, sorry, a shared reference and a unique reference, otherwise known as uh, shared, um, shared, aka immutable borrow. So actually, this is a better way. Shared reference, aka immutable borrow. Or you might have what is known as a unique reference immutable, as in this is a mutable or read write borrow. Now, uh, so C has, or in the standard library, has the concept of unique and shared pointers, but they're not encoded in the type system. At least that's my understanding. Whereas in Rust, they really are encoded in the type system. So we're spending a bunch of time talking about like what references are. Now let's talk about so, and we have one here. So the type of B two is some reference or to a B or to a book, and specifically it is of type shared reference. Uh, It isn't a and uh, otherwise known as like an, an immutable borrow. Uh, whereas, um, but so that's the type of B two and the reason why uh, we're allowed to access B one once we hit the end of the B two scope is that we don't touch B B one at all. Essentially, we're just pointing to it. We're just looking at it. Uh, however, we can't go. You know, we can't go and look at this. Is now a, an illegal program. So, uh, I want to add a little bit of complexity to our program, just to demonstrate a couple of other ways that we can. Oh, I should talk about the fact that we can opt in to. Uh, what is known as copy semantics as well. If we implement uh, copy ourselves, now you may wonder like what on earth can implement copy? And it turns out that any structure or enum whose members all implement uh, copy uh, will be able to be copied themselves. And that bubbles all the way down. So if we have bookshelf and then let's say we have a, a bookshelf containing um, books and probably let's say we've got space only for 20 books. Um, we've got some array. Then uh, on our shelf now we uh, I wonder if this will work I'm actually not defining a shelf yet but expect a value found struct aha got 50, 450 pages for this book Okay, so we get a couple of errors saying, or like warnings saying we define things that we never use, but actually uh, we don't get a warning that the bookshelf isn't invalid. Um, the definition though is, uh, so that's one, so copy is one way to avoid the problems with, um, with borrowing. So, uh, Actually, that's up here. So copy can be used to opt out of uh, ownership. And 
references can be used to opt out of ownership. Uh, in fact, in many cases, you'll want to use uh, copy. Uh, sorry, uh, use references um, for the reason that uh, we're going to encounter very soon. So I'm going to change the definition of shelf to take uh, a vector of books. And that's actually not a type. So now shelf will take, so now what we are looking at are ways to move ownership. So we have looked at moving ownership through a scope. We can also pass ownership uh, by moving values or moving the ownership of values into some parent structure. So let's say, for example, that we wanted our bookshelf here. And let's, uh, and now our bookshelf has two books. And now I can use uh, the macro. And we've got B1 and B2. Now I'm going to just create a new book so that we don't have the problem that we had before. And this one has pages, let's say, uh, 550, 540. Now there's booze instead of books. I'll need the semicolon and I want to be able to print out my shelf. I'll just get rid of this too because it's not as important now. So uh, we get a few warnings. We don't actually access books. So I'll just add the underscore to silence those. And so that this is a little bit easier to read, has no field name books. Oh gosh. And we get a similar warning that we never access pages. So I may as well um, just, uh, you know what I'll do. I will allow unused code in my examples. So now we are going to have fewer warnings. So what we're talking about now is, uh, oh gosh, oh, dead code. Anonymous. Aha, okay, we're finally printing out our shelf. In fact, we don't even need hello, we'll just print it out. Uh, we're talking about how to move our uh, move ownership. So ownership has actually moved into shelf. So now book B1 is again invalid to access and we will have receive a compiler error if we attempt to access it here in line 37. Oh, he says, have I, oh, because it's we've got clone and copy still implemented. I lied to you. Aha, good, I broke my program. So now again, we have the some issue with, with, uh, with my ownership. So that's one way of passing ownership. We have a shelf that uh, has a reference to books. Now, uh, again, we talked about one of the ways to opt out of borrowing, oh sorry, opt out of the ownership system is to use references. We can do the same thing within a uh, definition of a struct. So let's say we wanted a our shelf to contain references or essentially to borrow books and we would do this uh, so uh, by providing uh, or use the reference syntax and so now inside books is uh, uh, just references. Now this is actually invalid. Uh, it turns out that this is ambiguous as to like the life, the intended lifetime of our books and so Rust will compile the complain. Now the problem becomes, so let's actually try to see what happens if we try to actually ask Rust C to explain. The, this error indicates that a lifetime is missing from a type. If it is an error inside a function, which this one is not, 
it may be failing to adhere to lifetime volition rules. So, uh, it the lifetime volition rules are a certain type of uh, it says a limited kind of inference for lifetimes in function signatures. But outside of function signatures, which is what we've got, uh, we need to be more strict. What we're trying to do is define some structure. In our case, we're defining a structure shell. And we need to know, uh, Rust needs to know whether or not the reference of any of the, the references are going to be bound to the lifetime of shelf itself. <laughs> Allow me to explain what I mean by the way of like what would let's conceptually think about what might happen if I wanted to uh, uh, so this is all valid code now so this should compile and I get hello book on page 400 pages 450 so this is b1. And the uh, question is, does uh, if I were to move the if I were to move B1 into some other thread that could potentially outlive main, should the references still be valid? And uh, or at least should it have the static lifetime? And static essentially means is code for lives the lifetime of the program. Or should they in some sense be like bound to themselves? Uh, and the, the syntax of defining a lifetime parameter for a struct and then using it inside a, um, using it inside a sh the other like using it inside the struct means that I can do something like uh, this. Let's say that I, if I, if I later on wanted to extend my struct into have like a second bookshelf, let's say like top level and uh, bottom level books. So I've got two levels on my shelves, on my shelf, which doesn't make any sense, but uh, let's say left and right. Uh, the lifetimes here are distinct, or at least have the possibility of being distinct. They don't necessarily need to be the same. Um, the uh, Rust, however, will, so if I uh, have a shelf, one of the things that it uh, uh, prevents, if I, have, <laughs> if I have references into some type, I am no longer allowed to delete B1 or B2 whenever I want. So if I wanted to call, for example, uh, standard mem drop, which is uh, delete, I'll get a big problem that, uh, in fact, what I get told is that I'm trying to move something. It turns out that drop is implemented in quite an interesting way, which we could um, do ourselves. And uh, uh, essentially, it takes ownership of whatever it's attempting to delete or drop. And we can't give it, we can't give B1 to, uh, to the drop function because we've actually provided ownership to shelf. So the second way of providing a uh, the second way of providing ownership is to uh, call a function. And in this case, we could say, for example, delete b1. Oh, in fact, we could delete s. Yes. And you see here that this will not compile because we're specifying the wrong type. But what about if we change this to be some uh, type T? 
change that to data and then T. This works. <laughs> Uh, in fact, if I now attempt, I just say like what? The um, I will no longer be able to access B one because it's it's deleted. Oh wow 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 wow! I just lied to you. How did I do that? Ah, because I specified a reference. This is fascinating, isn't it? Like, so, so we have here a B one and B. So we've moved. Uh, we've moved. There's actually uh, we've got no code in this delete function at all, and yet what it essentially does is call data dot drop, or it 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 deletes it magically if you go and look at the definition of uh, standard mem drop you'll find that its definition matches the this uh, delete function here and it's all it is there's actually no code inside it it takes any type t and takes ownership by by owner by by ownership <laughs> and then deletes it so uh, we can, however, we can change it. Uh, if we can also move ownership by uh, out of a function through its return type. So uh, let's say we'll call this inspect. And I'll need to rebind it. So essentially, we take ownership. It got passes into this inspect uh, function. We uh, inspect it somehow. And then uh, return the data back. So then uh, we we'll rebind it to S and everything will work uh, fine. So we've got, so let's say uh, ownership um, and passing on it. Uh, let's say we can um, rebind with let, we can uh, move to fire function by return value. And uh, we can also pass ownership into a closure. Uh, a closure is a some callable object. Um, and it's, so even though we haven't defined it here, we uh, have some callable f that takes um, essentially no parameters here, but uh, let's, what do I want to do? I want to, let's say I want to inspect S from inside the callable and then I'll return F and then uh, return, this is, it returns a function and work and then down here I'll call work. So we, let's see if this, um, this does what we want. Expand, oh, I don't need a semicolon. So we're binding a, uh, in fact, we don't actually need a, a name binding. We'll just return a callable object from uh, this inner scope that becomes a variable function uh, work, and then we call it later on. Data is not a type. Oh, we return a T. And now we get ownership with borrow. So 37 
B1 has type block, which is going to copy. And I'm moving it into here. Which is a, uh, so we've got our inspection going. And that happened because uh, we actually passed. Uh, now, what do we pass here? It looks like we passed um, an ownership of, of S. Um, but what we actually passed was a reference to S. Um, it turns out that uh, closures accept um, references unless we specify this move keyword as well. Uh, it turns out that um, we, because we have specified a very generic um, type parameter, we can't. Uh, we, we it didn't. It didn't mind. So even though, um, so just to make that explicit. So when I am passing a uh, some variable into a closure, it will default to passing by reference, unless I specify move, and in which case I can uh, this closure that is it encloses the environment. It pull. It moves the ownership of the variable into S. Um, so another way to see this, if I try to um, I'll drop uh, S and it, oh, I can't find it. That's um, because it doesn't exist. It uh, in the in the the parent scope. Um, but essentially, I wouldn't be allowed to. Ah, if I try and drop B1, that isn't local scope. I get a warning that I've moved something, uh, which means that I can't touch it. Uh, so I've moved it into here, yes. No, I did just say that this would be happier this way. So I wonder if I've actually made a mistake. Now we get a different warning. So there's definitely different activity that's happening. So oh no, B1 has type book, which is not into a copy. We move it into book uh, into shelf. And um, let me have a think. I, the so I'm a little bit confused because I know that uh, the semantics do change if you move things versus if you don't. And the problem is that the movement has is happening in multiple places. At least that's my understanding, or at least that's why I think that I'm a little bit muddled up. Because what I'm interested in is expecting S, but I don't have access to S over here. Um, I wonder if I can try uh, something that's even more convoluted that um, essentially I'm now uh, creating some, in a, this scope is now irrelevant. I could just completely eliminate it. So I've got a callable and then I want to Okay, I get uh, the S, -S I, with hits moved, and so I can't delete it. So this is kind of what I originally intended when I uh, set up my example. Now, in principle, I'm now taking a reference to S in the inspect method. And so therefore, even though I take ownership of T, the T itself changes to a reference to S. And now I should be able to... Draw. Actually, no, this will also fail. <laughs> so if we go through the logic of this, I can't, uh, uh, even though I'm only taking a reference to S in this point, it's still, Rust is still going to enforce that I, I uh, have a valid reference to some data. And uh, so what I was attempting to do there was just a little bit... Uh, too tricky for my own good. What I was attempting to say was that I could have had some, uh, I, I could delete a reference to S, but 
I will um, allow myself to be satisfied that the borrow checker is doing its job and isn't allowing me to delete a variable while I still have a reference to it. Um, I wonder if the error message does change though. Uh, so it's you know, moved into closure moved. Hmm. I wonder if this, so it's the same error message. I wonder if the reason is that I am taking things by Uh, okay, because I'm using the data, the variable as a, uh, because I'm using the, I, like a moved value, the only way that this can compile was as if I would, it would be for me to, uh, the only way this would compile is if it, if Rust goes and acts as if I had used the keyword move. I can imagine there would be some situation in which I didn't have access to, I didn't require move uh, semantics, and that would be more valid for an inspect method where I just try to um, inspect it. And let's say we require that I'm inspecting my data. So we actually perform some inspection on a reference to T, uh, to some reference to T, and then I also return it, which I don't need to do anymore. Um, so I'm only looking at things. Now, oh gosh, I also need to pull in the trait if I want to use it inside the, um, inside a, as a type constraint. Oh gosh, I, I don't have a T, so I can only return a reference to T. How about I just delete that? I'm sort of losing myself, sorry about this. We still get the uh, uh, the problem with the ownership. Oh, okay, so I don't actually need... I shouldn't actually be able to print S at all here. Okay, so I require movement. So this is again the, one of the other ways of passing of 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 dealing with movement is that I um, I can pass ownership into a closure um, that would otherwise be happy to run, even though I've only used a reference. Uh, so I can essentially force um, Rust's hand. It would like me to do this and uh, print print happily. So um, that's that's the other way of passing ownership. So uh, via a function uh, or a closure. By the way, if you these are for strictly different um, uh, different types. Uh, if function is a so the if in keyword is actually a function pointer pointed to some section of data that is a um, a uh, some executable bytes and a closure is uh, stored on the stack as a struct and um, we just don't get access to the internals. Okay, so the so we've talked a lot about ownerships, a lot about references, and less about lifetimes. And that's because lifetimes don't appear so frequently um, in the code that you're likely to write at the start. You, uh, I see them as like binding two types together or at lifetime parameters. Oh, okay, uh, so a lifetimes are something different. I'll add a second concept. So they bind the lifetimes of two types together, or at least distinguish between uh, s 
static and um, some non-static type. <laughs> Uh, that's the that's a silly way to express it because if you don't know what the static lifetime means it refers to um, let's have a very brief chat about that so uh, first I'll add like a what for lifetimes it's like the span of time where a variable is valid to access the um, now uh, the lifetimes are almost are, are very rarely encountered anymore as the Rust uh, elision system, which we touched on earlier, is uh, becoming more and more advanced. Uh, it described itself before as a limited form of 